Hello friends, I'm Max and you're watching a video about my fifth year of developing a small log cabin camp away from people and roads in Karelia. In the previous episodes you might have seen how I was building my off-grid cabin from a typically large logs of about 40 cm 16 inches in diameter. It is obvious it would have been easier and faster to build a cabin using medium-sized logs, but I decided not to cut a single live tree. Rather, I used the available century-old pines downed by a severe storm from a few years back. In comparison to traditional sized logs of 20 cm diameter, these 40 cm logs are four times heavier. Initially, I had no plans to build a log cabin, but I couldn't just look at this high-grade construction lumber rotting and infecting young pines with pests and diseases. This post-apocalyptic scenery influenced me to pick up an axe and save at least some of the downed pine logs while clearing space for new trees. Besides building the cabin, I entertained myself with other bushcraft projects this season. I did some gastronomical experiments with a vertical grill and built another tarp hanger that is a lot larger than my old stretch film dome storage. I also modernized my swimming pond by raising its water level and carving granite steps to replace my aging step-down ladder as well as reinforced my bushcraft kayak before making a long voyage along a cascade of small local lakes. Now I have my own fleet hidden on the lake side of the remote forest. Also I cut slabs for my cabin's back door and experimented with baking a spiral potato. Even though I was baking it on a traditional horizontal grill, the result was very satisfying. I also fished a lot and cooked fish such as this pike using a Polish recipe. I improved my earth oven and learned to bake hearth bread, an excellent bushcraft food that is delicious, easy to make and has a long shelf life. In order to make hearth bread, I had to make an irregularly shaped wooden door and seal the gaps between the rocks with clay. This small time investment paid off though. It is such a pleasure to sit at my pond and eat a freshly baked loaf of bread in the middle of nowhere. Another project I made this summer was this shaving horse. Such contraption was widely used by barrel makers and carpenters in the past. You might have seen why I decided to make a shaving horse in the previous video. Even though I spent almost two days to complete it, I never regretted the time loss. It saved me time with my carpentry projects later, making the whole process safer. For example, it would have taken me two to three times longer to make this traditional pot holder without a shaving horse. I made this bushcraft tar distillery to produce tar and rosin and used rosin to adhere legs onto this primitive cutting board. As you can see, a lot of my projects interconnect with each other, but the main reason I made tar and rosin is for building a traditional Viking boat. I need tar and rosin for its waterproofing. I carved a primitive cooking mortar for my culinary experiments. I saw these traditional wooden mortars during my trip to Tanzania. Next season, I'm planning to make a mini meal powered by a water wheel. In the meantime, a good old cooking mortar and pestle will do. In other words, there were a lot of interesting adventures and projects during my three weeks stay at the log cabin. But in this video, I will focus on the first week of my vacation. As usual, everything started with the delivery of supplies from my boat to the campsite that is further inland. This year I brought a lot of gear and other needed supplies. If I didn't cut out a trail through hundreds of downed trees a few years back, 
I wouldn't be able to bring heavy equipment to my camp. My new custom-made modular backpack made the moving process much easier. This year I got a new 3000 watt generator to replace the one that broke last season. If it wasn't for my friend who came to my rescue with the temporary replacement generator, I wouldn't have those drone shots you saw earlier. I made four trips to my boat and back, which got me pretty hungry, so it is time to start cooking. At the beginning of any expedition, it is best to cook the most perishable products first. In my case, those were eggplants and marinated meat that I just brought from the boat. I decided to cook them using a vertical grill method, which you might have seen in one of my previous videos. This one is an expanded version where you can grill multiple skewered dishes at once. I'm sure many people will say that skinning eggplants is not the way to go aesthetically. Here is my reasoning. Because I will be vertically grilling, I can mix the taste of eggplants and meat by positioning the meat on the top of a skewer. This way, the sizzling fat will run down, enhancing the eggplant's taste along with the smoke of the charcoal. This is why I peeled, added diagonal cuts and rubbed olive oil onto the eggplants. I was so hungry that I even added a couple of skewered hot dogs to the grill. Friends, check this out. You can ignite smoke. I think it's called paralysis. As you can see, my vertical grill is quite mobile and you can easily move it to a different location even while it is burning, which is a pretty convenient feature to the vertical grilling method. These homemade metal log dogs came in handy, even though I usually use them for carpentry work. Another advantage of vertical grilling is that the fat doesn't drip on the hot charcoals, which would produce toxins while burning. So even health-oriented people don't have to give up delicious food cooked on the open fire. My vertically grilled dishes don't have any smell of burnt fat or toxins, but rather a smell of pure charcoal smoke. Friends, it is a pity the video can't give you any taste or smell samples. I would love to share the taste of it with each of you. If you watched my previous videos, you probably know that I brought and planted hundreds of deciduous trees and bushes around my log cabin camp. Most of them are growing in two nurseries not far from the cabin. It is important to help them survive during the first years in our harsh northern climate. As it often happens, you can do two different tasks at once. During my long absence, the bottom of my pond accumulated a lot of organic sludge, which is an excellent natural fertilizer for my saplings. I needed to clean the pond anyway, but throwing away organic fertilizer would be remorsefully wasteful, so I decided to allocate a spot for its composting. I weeded the saplings first. Luckily, you can easily make out rare and exotic trees from native plants. Then I laid out a layer of weeds on the ground for improvised composter, on which I dumped the sludge. I will use most of it next year when it turns into dark soil. Meanwhile, I used my last summer's stash of organic sludge to fertilize my trees and bushes. The dried organic sludge collected from the bottom of lakes or ponds looks very similar to peat but it is by far more valuable as a fertilizer. While carrying this water-saturated sludge, I came to a conclusion that my dam works as a filter separating and accumulating the sludge coming from the forest lake into the pond. 
To prevent it from happening in the future, I will have to add an overflow water pipe to my dam, but I will do it a bit later, as it is time to change the activity. I scythed the grass and removed some sod and soil to create a granite embankment. In Karelia, anywhere you stick a shovel in the ground, you will hit a granite plate. I'm going to carve out steps into the granite embankment to replace my aging wooden step-down ladder. I cut the sod on one side of the pond and moved it to the dam to reinforce it and to raise the pond's water level. Note, all my pond cleaning activities resulted in clogging the dam and raising the water level in it. The first step of my ladder is already submerged underwater. Meanwhile, the fresh sludge has dried out a bit and I will use a portion of it for tree planting now. This year I brought saplings of black walnut, northern catalpa and hard walnut trees. The hard walnut saplings were a gift from one of my subscribers. In about 20 years there will be a beautiful alley of walnut and northern catalpa trees leading to the log cabin. I hope to see it then. Ok, I'm done with all urgent tasks and now it is time for some fun. I decided to entertain myself by making an overflow valve in my dam. The valve will help me to quickly raise the water level in my pond as needed. Next year I'm planning to build a water wheel and a mini mill. On the other hand, when I leave my camp I can leave it open preventing the dam from working as a sludge filter, just letting it all flow downstream. I avoided using green wood on purpose because it will swallow and can even crack the pipe. This is why I made the plug from a semi-rotted aspen branch. My new bimetal bearded axe helped to achieve a perfect fit. If you want to see how it was forged from a tie plate and an old metal file, I will leave a link below. Besides the axe making process, the video has beautiful nature footage of the axe being tested in real world bushcraft activities. Ok, the aspen plug is made and it is time to install the whole contraption into the dam's wall. I recently found a clay source near my camp, which means I will be making some ceramics soon. Meanwhile, I applied some blue clay on it as a pressure damping sealant to prevent the plug from getting stuck or cracking the pipe. Now I can raise the dam's wall even higher without risking that it will be destroyed by high water in the spring. I need to raise the dam's wall by about 3 feet 1 meter to create enough water flow for my water wheel project next summer. It has been a dry summer, so I decided to mulch my southern nursery to slow down the water evaporation. Here you can see saplings of elegant birches, indigo trees, armor velvet trees, white acacia trees, German medlar trees, red bud cerces, scarlet red maple, catalpa, black walnut, heart-shaped walnut and Manchurian walnut, as well as a few more names I either forgot or their tree saplings didn't make it to this day. Meanwhile, you can see the water level raised to the second step of the pond's ladder and it is time to cook a meal. I already used up all perishable products and I need to start procuring food supplies to supplement the ones that I brought with me. Cooking a fish soup is a good solution to start conserving all my supplies. It is a simple and nutritious meal, a bushcraft fast food.
as I mentioned earlier, I brought a bucket of electricity to the camp this year, along with many battery-powered devices that I need for filming this video. The electronic devices filled a dedicated waterproof duffel bag that I brought in my boat. You're looking at the charging process of steady cams, flashlights, a car battery, an electric shaver, smartphones and a few power banks. Because the closest electrical outlet is many miles away from here, I always try to keep a sufficient backup in case of generator failure mostly for my power-thirsty video equipment, such as my drone, cameras and laptop. I also brought a couple of my power tools, such as a side grinder, to try them with my new generator. You've probably already guessed I'm carving steps for my pond to replace the aging wooden ladder I made five years ago. It could still serve me another decade while the granite ladder will compete with great Egyptian pyramids in its longevity. By the way, here is a cool hack. If you are wearing gloves, you can quickly change the side grinder's disc without using a wrench. It takes two quick hits and the disc's flange nut will loosen. You've probably noticed I installed an XLR audio connector as a surrogate plug-in power cord connector. Disclaimer: The XLR power cord hack wouldn't pass electrical codes in most countries. Please research this beforehand if you decide to use XLR connector for your power tools. I'm not sure if it's necessary to have a dust cover on my side grinder, but since it felt hot to the touch, I kept placing it in a waterproof bag and cooled it in my pond periodically during the grinding process. Making granite steps for my pond was an impromptu decision, which is why I don't have Mason's chisel. It is not a big deal though. If you have some tools and a burning desire to do something, you can always makeshift the tools you need. At home I have a chainsaw attachment that accepts a 12-inch diamond cutting disc, allowing to make 4-inch 10cm deep cuts. I think I will make the next step using my chainsaw. Every now and then people ask me how I managed to keep my clothes clean while doing construction work in my videos. Here's the answer. I use an old trick. It is quick and easy to wash clothes with your legs. This way your hands and back don't get tired. The legs can easily handle this simple task. Moreover, my hands and back even welcomed the change of physical activity. When I went back to my step grinding work, I felt fully refreshed. However, I wanted to mechanize the process and build a water wheel that could work as a washing machine drum while being powered by the water flow of this stream. And of course, it's a bushcraft version of a water wheel made from local material using primitive tools. The water wheel could also power a mini mill, a sharpening wheel, a forge blower, and perhaps even an electrical generator. Please let me know what applications of a water wheel at my log cabin camp would be the most interesting for you. You are probably surprised that there is an abundance of baby toads around here. 
the summer happened to be a typically dry. All the grass, including the sod on my cabin's roof, turned yellow. I suspect this is why the toads decided to migrate downstream and were doing it for five days. I should say it was very inconvenient as you have to constantly check where you're stepping. Luckily, by the end of the fifth day it started to rain and the amphibians must have changed their minds and stopped their migration. If working with hand tools, being surrounded by baby toads wasn't a problem, with power tools I had to sweep them away first, which was a slight inconvenience, to say the least. It is a pretty boring activity to grind and polish rocks, so I decided to take a break and went fishing at the nearby lake. It doesn't take long to catch a few perch in the forest's lake. Then I ground up some pepper. Freshly ground pepper is important for cooking. I added salt and pepper and pierced the fish onto two curved sticks. Note, it is better to use curved sticks as this way the fish will cook horizontally preventing juices from running out from its mouth. Lastly, I stuffed the perch with chopped onions. Usually I add wild chinterellas to my stuffing, but there were no mushrooms in the dry forest at this moment. I get a lot of questions about how I managed to finish so many projects in one month of my summer vacation. The answer is simple. I always try to work on a couple of projects at once. Here's an example. I'm cooking fish, making tea and distilling tar from pine roots, all at the same time. Ok, the lunch time is over and I'm going to finish polishing the granite step. Once done, I started to clear a spot located downstream from the pond. This is where I'm planning to make an aqueduct that would feed a clepsydra, a water timer, and a sink made from granite or wood. At least it will be easier to wash dishes. A bit later I might even make a water heater using a couple of copper pipes. Four summers ago I made another dam with a drain pipe a little upstream. That second dam was supposed to help to stabilize the water flow. I guess I inspired a local beaver with my efforts and he built his own dam on the top of mine. The beaver clogged the drain pipe too. As soon as I declogged the drain pipe, the water flow got noticeably stronger. So now I know there is enough height and water flow potential for my mechanical projects at the pond. With 6 feet 2 meters of height difference, I will be able to direct water into a wooden duct, creating an artificial waterfall that could rotate a water wheel. The water wheel will mechanically power a mini mill. I even plan to grow wheat and rye next year, so that I could make flour in the mini mill and then bake bread in my earth oven. Such bread could be considered 100% homemade. As you can see, the local amphibians are not afraid of me at all. Even though I kept scaring away this frog, it kept stubbornly coming back to the granite promenade. Perhaps it's because it liked to sit on the hot granite. I should say, it feels quite nice to stand barefoot on a polished granite step, warmed by the sun. In the future, I have plans to raise the pond's water level and to add rustic furniture to the granite promenade. It should transform the look of the pond for the better. Here is an interesting observation. A ripe raspberry doesn't sink or even get wet in water. 
there are raspberry bushes upstream and if you throw something at the bush while sitting in the pond, the water will deliver delicious ripe berries right to you. While I was enjoying the wild berries, the frog came back again. And it looks like it is making its own plans about beautifying the pond. In conclusion, I will demonstrate how to drain the pond to prevent sludge from accumulating in it during the off-season. I had to use my aluminum mallet to knock the plug out. Lastly, I decided to plug the drain in the upstream dam so that I wouldn't upset my neighbor, the beaver. But I will have to make a larger plug because I forgot that the drain pipe here is slightly larger in diameter and the plug that I brought from the downstream dam is too small. As you could see, besides working on the granite step, tending to the saplings and planting new ones, I spent the first week mostly on modernizing the dam and pond. The only additional project I managed to finish was to make a primitive tarp hanger. I'm not going to get into details because there is a separate video where I showed how to make a dome and a hanger using branches and tarp. I will have to say this summer I didn't get to use the hangar because there was barely any rain during my three week stay at the log cabin camp. This pile of sticks is what's left from my stretch film dome. The new hangar is standing right where the plastic wrap dome used to be. I'm quite happy with the hangar's design. It efficiently protects from the sun and rain. The blue tarp that has a straight cut is the same tarp that was presumably torn by the Yeti. This story comes from a bushcraft mystery incident described in one of my log cabin videos. I will bring my carpentry tools here to work on projects during rainy days. Again, this is the mystery tear. And you might have seen this green tarp in the video about my bushcraft kayak and catamaran. Okay, this video has gotten long and it is time to say goodbye. I will only add that during my three week stay I filmed enough material to assemble a couple more videos of this length. This is Maxi Gorov from St. Petersburg, Russia. If you like this video, perhaps you could share it with your friends. Let good people watch good videos.
P.S. I only produce one or two videos max a month. And if you don't want to miss new content like this, subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with all of the latest content. Due to new YouTube's recommendation algorithm, its notifications have become more erratic and unstable otherwise. I hope to see you back on Advoca Makes. PPS. For your convenience, I will leave a link to my playlist of other bushcraft videos in the description below.